good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a while been, since I've been on the podium, so uh, bear with me. Um, I've just taken over as the interim CEO for TMK uh, uh, after a fairly active uh, period for the company. Um, I guess, you know, timing and a bit of luck, uh, two things that we haven't uh, addressed in this conference yet, but I think very important to all, uh, certainly small caps and uh, micro caps. While everybody reads that, uh, I'll just start with a bit of a story. My background was uh, I started the industry in, in the Perth Basin with two of the first companies that were uh, in the Perth Basin Discovery and uh, Arc Energy. And uh, again, timing and a bit of luck would have really changed uh, the outcome for those companies with what's gone on in the Perth Basin. And, and uh, I guess some of the big discoveries have been made, um, you know, pretty material. And, uh, you know, I think we've made a pretty material discovery in in Mongolia. My entree to Mongolia was really, uh, I used to be managing director of Elixir, and uh, again, timing and luck, we had a look at, good look at uh, Lockheed Deep when Empire Oil, Oil had it. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't raise the funds at the time, and bizarrely enough, we also looked at uh, what uh, the Trum Trough where Elixir currently is, and uh, uh, couldn't raise the funds at the time to do that either, so uh, with a different gas market in the East Coast. So I guess we uh, looked at Mongolia and Neil had a private company that uh, we backdoored into Elixir and then off it went and, and did very well. We had some Alaskan assets that I uh, took to an, uh, another company that was subsequently taken over by 88 Energy. And I think all shareholders of Elixir and, uh, and XCD uh, did pretty well out of that. So I guess at that time I, uh, this opportunity came across my desk. Uh, uh, a guy called uh, Brendan Stats, who was our CEO till recently, uh, and is currently at site in Mongolia, uh, getting ready for drilling, um, presented, and he'd been in Mongolia for 10 years as a, a coal geologist and uh, pretty much knew every coal deposit in Mongolia, and had come across this one with, um, uh, or this opportunity with some locals, uh, and wanted, didn't really know what to do with it, I guess, was the, uh, so I got in contact, we, raised money privately, uh, about a million dollars or so. Uh, we did a deal with Talon Energy, uh, Dave Casey's probably around here somewhere, uh, who really loved the project. Uh, they came in as a farming partner. Uh, subsequent to that, we then backdoored the uh, asset into uh, Tamasco Oil & Gas, which is now TMK. So, so we drilled five exploration wells in the early days, uh, all found um, uh, thick coals uh, with all the right attributes for uh, coal seam gas, as Brendan had predicted, and uh, we quickly booked a contingent resource uh, of 1.2 TCF. Now, it's twice the size of Waitsia uh, and, and some of the other fields have been discovered in the Perth Basin, so it's pretty significant. Um, the subsequent to that, we then did a, a talent exercise, their right to move forward with the project and do a pilot well um, uh, project to, to prove we can get the gas out of the ground in commercial rates. And that was uh, completed uh, approximately a year ago and the wells put on production. So, so uh, since then, we've been doing a, a few things and we'll come to a, a little uh, graph in a minute and we'll talk about that. But corporate structure, uh, you know, like everybody, we've been hit uh, share price wise, uh, we did the Talon, uh, when Talon was taken over or merged with uh, Strike, uh, we bought back the interest, uh, our 33% 33, 33 they had. Uh, we offered, we, we issued about 15% of our company uh, shares to buy back 33%, uh, about a billion shares or so, and uh, subsequent to that, uh, we, uh, we saw a fair bit of demise in the share price, which I think was uh, probably a half expected uh, um, given the, uh, the, the shareholder base of Talon at the time. Anyway, we've, we've continued on from there and uh, we've, we've, the, the project's made good progress and uh, uh, we're in a reasonably good shape to drill some additional wells, which we'll come to in a minute. So boards here, a couple of our board members in the audience. Uh, uh, John Warburton, who's our chairman, now chairman, is uh, been on the board of, uh, in the past, Senex, uh, so very uh, familiar with uh, coal seam gas uh, that was taken over uh, by Hancock and POSCO. Uh, and then uh, he's currently on the board also of Empire Energy, which is doing something in the uh, similar Beetaloo uh, project, not coal seam gas, but shale gas. So Mongolia, I don't need to go too much about this because I think uh, Neil's already addressed this uh, in numerous uh, presentations in the past, but obviously, uh, you know, energy short, uh, 
uh, you know, a huge opportunity, big mining industry like WA, um, and uh, you know, the coal seam gas industry is just emerging, but could be very significant uh, for the country and uh, obviously for early movers like TMK. Sort of our immediate activity in Catalyst, we've been working away on these pilot wells. So we've come to the conclusion we do need to drill additional wells, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, you know, we're now hoping to drill three additional wells within uh, infill wells, essentially, to increase the density of the, uh, the dewatering and depressurisation. And hopefully we'll get there um, you know, sooner, but we're sort of targeting end of March next year to, to prove commercial flows. And commercial flows in this area is probably in the region of 100,000 scuffs a day. It's not a lot, but these, cheap, these wells are cheap, uh, vertical uh, wells, unstimulated. Uh, so you can, you can do a lot, uh, a lot of damage for that, for your money. I'll just skip through to this one. Uh, so look, we never really showed this in the past, but uh, this sort of shows where we've uh, been for the last year. And, uh, and, and sort of why some of the decision making has uh, resulted as, uh, in, in us uh, deciding to drill three additional wells. So early on we, uh, we got a, you know, gas pretty early, uh, we were flaring gas and we're the only uh, uh, coal seam gas um, uh, developer in Mongolia that is actually consist has been consistently flaring gas for 12 months. Uh, so we got some pretty good results early and uh, it was all looking pretty positive. We did some testing to make sure that the wells were actually talking to each other and we had good permeability between the wells, the three pilot wells. Then we had a bit of a period of a couple of blockages with pumps, which always happens. It was actually just one, one well, which was our deepest well. We had some uh, blockages, had to pull the pump a couple of times. And then we started seeing some fairly nice little blips in the uh, gas rate and we thought, right, we're on our way, this is all, this is all good. Uh, but then, of course, you know, that sort of uh, petered back to more a stable flow. Um, we did some other testing at that time to, to uh, see you know, what, uh, uh, what some differing uh, production methods. Uh, again, we, we've been through this, uh, the last sort of three or four months of pretty stable flows. And there's a big dip in the water rate there is when we had a bit of a, uh, a surface issue with one of the uh, um, uh, surface facilities which we fixed. And then, again, we've been just doing some other testing in recent uh, weeks and uh, to, to determine if there's better ways to get better flows or increased uh, gas flows out of the, uh, the wells. But you can see in general there's a, there's a decline in the, in the water rate and the gas rate's been fairly stable. And we're looking for that point where we re the, reach the critical desorption where gas rates take off and water rates start coming, still continue to come down. So we did a number of independent reviews and spoke to every expert in, in coal seam gas we could find in Queensland and they've all come to the same conclusion that the, the best way forward is to uh, drill more wells and we'll get there quicker. So uh, Brendan again and, and others have all said that the longer these things take to dewater, the more gas you get out of them in the long run. So it's not a bad thing, um, uh, but you know, ultimately the market can't wait uh, as long as maybe ideally you would want to if, uh, if capital and time wasn't an issue. So I'll just skip forward to here, which is basically the, uh, where we are. We have two seams. It's only the upper coal seam that we've, uh, we've booked any contingent resource to. Uh, there is a lower coal seam, but uh, the, the initial uh, exploration wells you know, didn't show high permeability in that seam. Uh, so we're focused on the, on the upper coal seam, which is, which is you know, as I said, 1.2 TCF is plenty of gas to get on with. And this is only in a very small area. We're surrounded by coal mines, there's plenty of data, uh, and there's actually a, a market right there for the gas that we uh, can initially produce from these pilot wells. All the coal miners use um, power imported from China, and occasionally that gets turned off, and when they turn that off, they've got to burn diesel, which obviously costs a fortune. Uh, so there's a, there's a market of 35 to 50 megawatts directly where we are, and we're literally 100 metres from a, a substation. So we've drilled the three pilot wells, LF1, 2 and 3, Lucky Fox 1, 2 and 3, uh, all reasonably successfully, and now we're looking at infilling in that uh, to try and get increase the density, which on a... Oops, sorry. Uh, so this is only in the very small little area where you can see the red dots and the green dot. Uh, that's where we're focused at the moment with a pilot well, but ultimately we're looking at uh, expanding across the whole uh, uh, upper coal seam there, it runs uh, east-west, 
and that runs for a lot further, but the, our current contingent resource is only where we've drilled the exploration well, which, which was SL1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Uh, SL2, uh, Snow Leopard, SL, SL Snow Leopard 2, was where we did the pilot wall program. So really we're uh, in this phase of uh, getting to the point of critical desorption. We're about 60, when we did the uh, shut-in test in January, February, we were about 65, 70% the way there to get into critical desorption. And the wells probably will get there, but as I said, it will take too long for, uh, uh, for you know, the market really. And so we're just really accelerating the process um, by drilling three additional wells in the, in the area. Uh, the, as I said, the market is pretty, uh, pretty good locally with uh, you know, early commercialisation uh, for the coal miners. Uh, there's other opportunities in Mongolia. They import gas from, uh, the only gas they uh, get is from uh, Russia and that's pretty expensive, comes in bottles. Uh, so there's things like mini LNG, CNG. And I think there's an obligation uh, on all producers in Mongolia to, to serve the local market before you uh, can start talking about exporting it to China, which is ultimately the goal here for uh, a very large resource. So we have a, we have a conceptual stage development plan. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, I think, uh, you know, Elixir has spoken about this many times in the past, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, impetus from the government to do something about air quality in Mongolia. It, it, in Ulaanbaatar, it's particularly bad. Uh, I think it's the most uh, polluted capital city in the world, and all their power is coal-fired. So um, that they really do need to do something about it, and gas being hopefully the, the transition fuel, uh, and the most obvious one in Mongolia. Solar and wind, there are you know talks of doing all this sort of uh, energy in Mongolia, but it's difficult. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to get the capital. Uh, solar is not particularly good. Mongolia is very cold and uh, long winters, uh, so it, you know it, it really is. Uh, the fuel of the future for Mongolia, in my opinion. Oh, sorry. Uh, where we are, we're down right on the border of China. We're only about uh, uh, 30 kilometres from the border. As you drive from, uh, this is just the, the region. Uh, Delansgate is the local capital of the South Gobi province. Uh, Ulaanbaatar is, is about 500 kilometres north of that. And as you drive down there, you do drive across a fairly uh, rugged desert to get to our area. But once you get there, it's a lot of infrastructure, huge coal mines. Uh, oops, and Brett uh, Lawrence and myself went down uh, to the border on our last visit in June, and there was a 20 kilometre row of trucks crossing, waiting to cross the border full of coal into China. So it's a, it's a massive uh, import-export route for, uh, uh, for Mongolia. And there's a lot of infrastructure. There's talk of railway lines. There's already high high tension power lines going across the border and obviously in the future that's where we'd be looking to do some form of uh, export route if, uh, if that came about. Uh, we, so that's the, that's the Chinese uh, uh, demand story. Uh, we don't need to go on that. You know, China's desperate for energy. The great thing about having a PSC in Mongolia is that the government by virtue of the PSC owns about 30, depending on your production rates, but at a high level it would be 30 to 35 per cent of the project. So there's no real incentive for the, uh, for the government to sell cheap to China. They'll want to get a market price, so we think uh, we're in a good position there from a, from a cross-border negotiation point of view. And I said that there's a local market anyway, which we can sort of start a, a business. We've got a fairly uh, strong Mongolian red, part of the register, um, our biggest shareholders got 23% is Mongolian businessman. Uh, there's other Mongolian high net worth guy, uh, people in there. There is a lot of uh, wealth in Mongolia. Uh, not a lot of cash, but there's a lot of wealth. And uh, people are invested in mining projects uh, across the board. Relatively small population, um, but uh, you know, very progressive. And uh, I'd have to say, a Tuesday night or Wednesday night, Mongolia is a lot more active than it is in Perth. So uh, yeah, I think we can, uh, uh, and a very young population too, and uh, uh, you know, very, very keen for development. And with that, that's pretty much it. But the main catalyst for us in the very short term is drilling these additional wells, hopefully getting to commercial, a demonstration commercial production. And if we can do that, I think the game changes for uh, not only TMK, but Mongolian CBM industry. Which is which is still in the emerging stages. Thank you very much.